Welcome back, everyone. For today's video, we are going to be taking a look at the third round of the Sinkfield Cup, which is part of the Grand Chess Tour and being held in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, you guys might have been wondering why I haven't done recaps up to this point, in spite of the fact that there are many top-level players, including Fabiano Caruana, Jan Nepomuchi, Notarbek Abdu Satorov, Ali Reza Ferruja, and everybody else. Now, that is not meant as an insult to any of the other players, but just to give you guys an idea of how strong the event is. Nonetheless, up to this point, there has only been one decisive game in the first 10 games or the first two days of the event. And last year, there were also very few decisive games or eight decisive games in nine rounds, five games a day. So I think that's eight out of 45. So a very, very low number with so many draws. I didn't really feel compelled to cover the event. However, today, which is the third round, we have a very exciting game being played between Jan Nepomniachtchi, the two-time challenger for the World Championship, and Anish Giri from the Netherlands. Now, Anish is fresh off a very brutal defeat at the, Han at the hands of Hans Niemann in the Netherlands recently, so he's trying to recover from that, and he's off to a decent start with two draws, but let's jump right into the action. All right, so the game starts out with D4, Jan with the white pieces, and here we get the move Knight to F6, C4, E6, Knight C3, and now we have the move Bishop B4. This, of course, is the classic Nimzo Indian defense, pretty standard stuff here, and now we get the move E3 being played. After E3, Anish decides the castle, and now Nepo plays the move A3. Now, as you guys probably know, I do most of these recaps right on the fly, so some of my information might not be 100% correct, but back during the world championship match between Jan and Ding, they had something very, very similar to this, if in fact not the exact same position. So we get takes, takes. We have d6 being played here. Jan plays f3. We get to move knight c6. And now Jan plays e4, building the classic big white center here. You've got these pawns from f3 to e4, c3 to d4. But you also have this hanging pawn on c4, which can be targeted quite easily because you simply are protecting it only with one lone bishop. So after e4, on each plays queen e8. And now Jan plays h4. Now this is an idea that I've seen in various Nimzo Indians before. This is Alpha Zero style. A lot of the top computer programs like Sockfish or Leela, they recommend these ideas where you simply push p and you ignore everything else. Now keep in mind, white has the center. You've got all these pawns in the center. So pushing on the edge seems a little bit counterintuitive, but computers these days are showing us that all these ideas are completely reasonable. So we get b6 from Anish. Jan plays h5 here, and now we get to move bishop to a6. Anish's idea here is that he wants to go knight to a5 and capture this pawn on c4. Jan plays the move rook to a2 here, and this is where I refer to the world championship match between Ding and Jan, where in a game with Ding having the white pieces, he played this rook a2 maneuver, a little bit different position, but the same concept within the Nimzo Indian. Anish goes knight to a5, and now we get the move g4. Now at this point, you're probably thinking, what is wrong with Jan Nepomnishi here? He's pushing all these pawns. He's played h4, h5. He's played g4. He's gone f3, e4, d4. D and he's all also played the move, move c4. Actually played e3 and e4 in two moves, so it's not one move. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 of his first 12 moves have been pawn moves. Now, there is a famous streamer by the name of I Show Speed who's not super familiar with chess, and I have occasionally seen him try to play the game. And when he plays chess, he usually pushes all the pawns up the board. So what is going on here? Do we have a world championship level player suddenly forgetting how to play chess? Is he memeing? Who knows? Now, what's awesome about this position is the computer says that black is only very marginally better in spite of the fact that white has violated just about every rule in the book of chess. So... We get the move queen c6, and now Jan moves the rook to g2 here. What Jan is doing is he's trying to argue with this big white center, these four pawns, that white doesn't have to do anything with these pieces. Don't develop anything. Simply push p on the king side, push the g and the h pawns, and try to use the two rooks on these files. So we get the move bishop takes c4. Bishop takes bishop. Queen takes bishop. And now we have the move knight to e2, an important move here to protect the pawn on c3 and also reinforce the pawn on d4. On each plays knight d7, and now we get the move g5 here. And it's very clear that what Jan is doing is he's going to push g6 or h6, and he's trying to argue that with the open files for the two towers, white has a big attack. Now, as you'll probably also notice, the computer says that after knight to b3, bishop to e3, and a move like rook a e8, black is apparently quite a bit better here, but it's very scary to play like this because you're simply letting white push these pawns up the board, and you don't have a concrete plan. You haven't played e5, you haven't played d5, you haven't played c5. You are not attacking the white center. So... After g5, we get the move e5 from Anish, and now Jan plays the move g6, throwing all caution to the wind and following his plan to open up the files. 
Now here, Anish plays the move Pawn takes Pawn, and this is the start of going in a wrong direction. What Anish probably should have played here is this move H6. No doubt he was very concerned about White sacking the Bishop, and after takes Queen C1, the computer says after King G7, Black is okay, but it's almost impossible to do this because after Knight to G3 here, suddenly the White Knight is coming to F5, and you take on G6, I take, and now you're getting mated on all files here. Your King is completely open, and it looks impossible to play. Now, this also reminds me a lot of a famous chess player, a former world champion by the name of Michael Tal from uh, Latvia, the, considered to be the magician from Riga. He was a player who loved to sacrifice pieces, go all in. He felt like his opponents would not be able to calculate and play the best moves. And this is a perfect example of where Jan is channeling his inner Michael Tal. He's trying to be very aggressive, and he's trusting his opponent will start to see the boogeyman. Now, I don't blame Anish at all for missing this line, because knowing that you can go F5 here and you're fine, or even, frankly, seeing that there might be something like... Uh, there might be something like takes and then a queen h6 here it just looks incredibly crazy after king e8 black is okay here but again it feels very scary and white might even be able to play something like this with h6 h7 and it's still anyone's game all right so Anish decides to take on g6 we get takes now he plays the move rook takes f3 and now yawn plays this counterintuitive move g takes h7 you're probably thinking well white wait shouldn't you take with the rook stack the rooks and go for mate this would actually lose because after knight f8 attacking the rook when you move the rook away to say h5 after rook e8 you cannot go rook h2 here because after knight takes pawn suddenly your checkmating threats evaporate so we get g takes h7 on each place king h8 now we get the move rook h to g1 here and white is stacking the rooks and going after the pawn on g7 now you will notice computer already thinks this position is equal if not perhaps slightly better for white and it's incredible when you think about it because the lack of peace peace moves here that uh, that uh Jan has made is incredible bishop underdeveloped queen has not moved king has not moved white has pushed so many pawns but even so the king is very safe here with the knight and the pawns the knight and these central pawns give the king a haven or a nest to be safe in so we get rook f7 from Anish and now we have this move bishop to h6 which is a great idea from Jan he's trying to rip open the g file here and go after the black king now the only move you can play here to keep the game going is to take the bishop if you don't take the bishop let's just say you play g6 after rook takes g6 let's say rook h7 I can simply go check takes takes and now your king is very close to getting laddered on the edge of the board after saying knight f6 and queen c1 suddenly there are all kinds of mates here your king is just too naked and you will lose the game so on each takes the bishop we get rook to g8 check and on each captures the pawn you cannot play rook takes rook because after pawn takes rook equals queen this would be gg why not so we get the move king to h7 rook takes rook is played here and after rook takes rook now we take stock of the position white is currently up a rook for a knight and incredibly here due to the knight in the central pawns this king on e1 which has not moved is still very very safe here that being said black should be okay with precise play on each decides to play the move knight to f6 here and this is the first move which is a step in the wrong direction what on each should have played here was this move queen to c6 attacking the rook on a8 and the pawn on e4 at the same time now if white tries to play a move like rook g to g8 after queen takes e4 check king here let's just say check for example now you can play the move rook to g7 and after takes takes there simply are no threats for white it's a lone rook going after the black king and black can start going after this white king in due time so Anish decides to play the move knight f6 instead which is a mistake and Jan very quickly snaps the juicer on e5 and here we get this move knight takes e4 now probably at this point I assume Anish was not sensing that there could be a lot of danger in this position and he simply blunders away here now at this point the best move would be knight d7 and if white takes now you have knight e5 and suddenly the knight is jumping to go after this vulnerable white king on e1 alas after takes we get the move knight takes e4 also one other point if black were to take the pawn here after queen to d8 suddenly the queen combined with the two towers are too much for the black king and this king is simply going to be checkmated in a couple of moves so we get knight takes e4 and now Jan plays move queen c1 and this is another incredible move from Nepo and as you'll probably notice after knight takes e4 queen c1 the bar starts to shoot up at this point white is simply winning the game pretty much no matter what black does now the main reason white is winning is that if black were to play a move like pawn takes pawn white can sack the rook with rook to h8 takes check block and after queen to f8 your king is simply stuck here it will get mated after queen g8 queen and queen takes queen so what do we get here after queen c1 anish desperately trying to keep the game alive plays move knight g5 to cut off the threats towards the king 
But now Jan plays the move rook takes g5, sacking the rook. And this, of course, is the best move, as the computer says. We get queen to h4 check. If you were to take the rook after queen takes pawn, there are all kinds of checkmates around this king. Your knight on a5, very much out of play here, and you will lose. So after rook takes g5, we get queen h4 check, rook g3, queen h1 check. And now the move rook g1 is played by Jan. And here Anish captures the rook. Now you're probably thinking, well, let's do the count. On deux, trois, quatre, cinq, on deux, trois. White is down two pawns here, but due to the vulnerability of this black king, Jan is going to finish off this game with great flair and style. He plays move queen c2. We get to move king to h8. And now we have queen to g6 here, attacking the rook on f7, but also threatening to take the pawn on h6. Now, Anish plays the move queen to f8 here, guarding the rook and the pawn at the same time. But now Jan plays move e6, just pushing p. And at this point, as you'll see from the evaluation bar, black is simply lost. Now, it doesn't look obvious on first glance here that white is simply winning, but let me explain why. If black plays rook to f6 here, attacking the queen, you push e7. If black were to take the pawn, you have queen to g8, which is checkmate. And if you play any other move like rook takes queen, I take your queen with a check. And after king h7, queen f7 check, I will win this rook and checkmate in two moves. So you can't go rook f6 here. If you go rook g7, I will take this pawn. And after king g8, now I have rook to h1. And this pawn on e6 stops the king from ever escaping. So queen to h8 will be checkmate. Or there's probably some way to sack material and dodge it for a few moves. But at any rate, you are getting mated on the h file, even if you sack all your material. So you can't go rook to g7. But then what else can you do? Now, the two moves, I believe in the game, rook to e7 is played. Rook h7 is the one other option. But now white can go rook to f1, attacking the queen. And after queen g8, queen f6 check. You block with the queen, I check, and then play the move rook to f8. And after rook g7 and e7, I'm getting a second queen, and we'll win the game very soon. If you play the move rook to g7, I'll take the pawn. And after, say, queen to h7, now I go rook f8, rook g8. And there probably are a couple ways to win, but the cleanest is to simply trade the queens and push this pawn. Supports the rook, but it's also going forward. White will get a queen and win. So... Anish decides to play rook e7, which is one other alternative, but now Nepo plays the move rook to h1, threatening to, to take the pawn on h6. Anish goes rook h7, and now we get the move rook f1, and effectively we transpose back into the other variation. Anish plays queen to d8, and now we get this move rook to f7, another crushing move here, because now white is threatening to take the rook with mate, and after takes, takes, now there's a threat of queen h6 mate, and a threat of queen g8 mate, and you have a pawn on f7. So Anish goes queen f8, we get queen f6, king h7, and after this move, knight to f4. Anish Giri resigns this game, and Jan has played 37 moves, and he has not moved his king the entire game. The king has stayed on e1 from start to finish. It has not gone anywhere, and this is simply a marvelous win for Nepomnishi in this game. Just an amazing performance by him. Played a great game. For Anish, of course, you feel very bad for him. He kind of got blown off the board in this game. Felt like Nebo just went after him, attacked him with everything, and he wasn't able to defend precisely. But for Jan, this probably goes down as one of his best wins in his career because winning a game like this against a top, top player and never moving your king in the entire game is definitely special. So... Jan Nepomuchi wins this game. This means that temporarily, at least, he will be tied for the lead in the Sinkfield Cup after three rounds. We don't know the results in the other games necessarily. He could be behind, but it uh, looks pretty likely he'll be leading the event at the 33% mark. So, on that note, I hope you guys have enjoyed this recap of the game for the third round of Sinkfield Cup between Anish Gira and Jan Nepomuchi. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, make sure that you smash that subscribe button below. And we'll be back with some more great recaps, whether it's from like Jose and Vladimir, whether it's from the Sinkfield Cup, whether it's my own events. But we'll be back with some great recaps in the near future. So I hope you enjoyed it and have a great rest of your day. See you guys. Bye.